All right, well, good morning. Well, at least to the two thirds of you who showed up this morning. Okay. Well, um, first, let me just note again that if you didn't pick up the homework last week, they're up here. Um, very short homework set this week. Um, really, it's just based on today and Wednesday's material. Friday is your midterm exam, and I believe we've already talked a little bit about that. Um, Wednesday, I'll set aside time, you know, last 10 minutes or so of class, just to talk more about the midterm. Um, but again, the midterm is this Friday. Um, anything from section 10.4 which is, you know, ranking cycles right through section 14.3, which was the basics associated with air water vapor mixtures that we covered through last week. Um, the homework from last week, which is due Wednesday, is fair game for the midterm. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, also a reminder, you know, keep a copy of your homework before you turn it in Wednesday, since I'll have it in my possession for those few days, a couple days really before the exam. All right, so let's get back to our discussion of air water vapor mixtures. Um, right now, we're talking about the dew point, or really, we just finished talking about the dew point. Um, hopefully, at this point, we understand that um, you know each component in the air water vapor mixture behaves as if it existed alone in the entire atmosphere, and as such. Um, each component, being the water vapor and the dry air, are going to have their own partial pressures. Um, so basically, the water behaves as if it existed at that particular partial pressure. You know, whatever the partial pressure is for that particular atmospheric air, that's how the water behaves. And therefore, at that partial pressure, that's what would correspond to the phase change. Um, if we have, let's say, very moist air at a high temperature, and then we cool it down. We understand that in cooling down the air, um, then eventually we'll get to some temperature which corresponds to the saturation temperature at the partial pressure of that water vapor. And at that point, that's when the phase change is going to occur. And the water vapor in the atmosphere is going to start to condense into liquid water. Um, we call this temperature the dew point. Um, we looked at an example problem um, associated with the dew point last time. Um, I suppose one other thing that should also be noted is that the use of the dew point actually gives us an ability to determine the amount of water vapor, um, whether it's the absolute humidity or relative humidity, in the atmospheric air. Uh, we can set up a test, if you will, or an experiment. Um, we could simply take our atmospheric air and cool it while observing its temperature. And at the point where the water vapor begins to condense, that's the dew point. So we would record that. Then based on our dew point temperature data and the temperature of the atmospheric air itself, we should therefore be able to find the conditions, the, the moisture conditions in the environment. So it's not just so that we can figure out if the eyeglasses are going to fog up or if you can have fogging up on the inside of your window, your windshield, and your car. Um, you know, there may be very legitimate reasons why we may want to you know, use the dew point, um, again, just to give us a feel for the amount of water vapor in the air, which tells us something about, well, the comfort of that air. So let me just illustrate that with one other example. Um, let's say that we have atmospheric air, and it's at 20 degrees Celsius. I'm sorry, 30 degrees Celsius. Okay. And this atmospheric air at 30 degrees Celsius is passed through a cooler, uh, some sort of heat exchanger, something that allows us to cool the air. And we observe that water begins to condense out of the air when the temperature of this air reaches 20 degrees. So water begins to condense out of the air at 20 degrees Celsius. Um, if we note that the pressure in the atmosphere is 100 kilopascals, whoops, um, then we want to find a couple of things. Uh, most notably, we want to find the specific humidity as well as the relative humidity. 
Okay. So this problem basically is an illustration of the dew point, right? We have our water vapor in the air. Um, at 30 degrees Celsius, there could be a lot of water vapor in the air. Um, as we cool it, we begin to notice the condensation occurring at 20 degrees. So basically, 20 degrees Celsius represents the dew point, right? At this point, the air is saturated. So 20 degrees C is the dew point. And at this point, air is saturated. Um, remember that when we talk about saturated air, we're talking about air that's holding the maximum amount of water vapor at that particular temperature. Okay. So how do we use this to determine omega and phi? Um, so first, let's look at the end of the process. Okay. And when I say at the end, in other words, this is when the condensation begins to occur. Okay. So we would know that at that point, the air is saturated. So at the end, we're at 20 degrees Celsius, right? So at 20 degrees Celsius, um, we can go into our table, um, which would be table A4, our water tables, and we could find the saturation pressure. So P sat at 20 degrees Celsius can easily be looked up. It's 2.3392 kilopascals. Okay. And the fact is, this is our partial pressure of the water vapor at that final point, that is, as the condensation begins. Um, and because it's saturated, we could also show that that's equal to Pg. So we can then find the specific humidity. And again, we can call this absolute humidity or humidity ratio. Um, but we can now find this, again, at the end. So I'll just put at the end, in other words, at 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and we just use the equations we have previously developed. So this is probably the equation, I shouldn't say probably, this is the equation we want to utilize. Um, we know the partial pressure of the water vapor at this temperature, PV. We, we know the atmospheric pressure, that's the total pressure P. So we just plug in the numbers from above. So we can just rewrite it this way. Um, again, just plugging in PG for PV. Um, we'll go through a little bit of mathematics. And I'm not going to bother to plug in the numbers. Again, noting that the total pressure is 100 kilopascal. We go through our math, and we end up with omega of 0 0.0149. Um, and keep in mind that the units are going to be the amount of water vapor per unit of dry air. So this is kilograms of water vapor per kilogram of dry air. And that is omega. Now, I'm sure you're saying, well, wait a minute. This is at the end of the process. Why am I underlining it as if this was the solution to the problem? Don't I want to know what omega is in the atmospheric air before it actually goes through this whole process of cooling? Well, sure we do, but aren't they the same? Um, this is the specific humidity. This is the ratio of the amount of water vapor to the amount of dry air. Um, until that condensation begins to occur, there is no difference between omega and the final omega, right? Um, in other words, the amount of water vapor doesn't change, the amount of dry air doesn't change just because we're moving through this cooling process. It isn't until we finally get to 20 degrees Celsius and go beyond that particular temperature that the water vapor is going to begin to condense out of the air. So the fact is, this omega is the same as the omega in the atmospheric air. Again, nothing has changed. Yes, it's cooled, but we haven't condensed anything out yet. We're just beginning to condense out at 20 degrees Celsius. So essentially in the limit, when we're just at 20 degrees Celsius and we're just beginning to observe some water vapor condensing, that's the value of omega we're looking for. So this is at the end of the process, but this is also omega in the atmospheric air. Okay. Again, during this process, as we go from 30 to 29 to 28, eventually to 20, no change takes place in the mass in the mass of water vapor or the mass of the air. So this has to be the right value of omega. Um, now that we have this, now we can find the relative humidity of the atmospheric air. Okay. So really, this is just a matter of utilizing the appropriate equations. Um, I think the equation that I called equation C is the one that we'd want to use here. This is just omega times the total pressure, or 0.622 plus omega 
and then times pg. Okay. Now, please note that we have a lot of this data already, but not everything. Um, now here, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, we know everything. What do you mean only partially everything? We have pg, we have p, we have omega. But we really don't have pg yet. Okay, keep in mind that this pg, this is saturated air at 20 degrees Celsius. This equation applies to the atmospheric air um, before the cooling process takes place, right? So pg is actually a little bit different, right? This is the saturation pressure at the given temperature of 30 degrees. So this, perhaps, we want to write as pg 30 degrees. And just to make it a little more clear, we might even want to go back here and just note that this is pg at 20 degrees Celsius, and they're not the same. So maybe write PG20, PG20, something like that, just so we know that the two are indeed different. So this is for the atmospheric air now. Um, now we can plug in all the numbers. So we take omega of the atmospheric air, um, again noting that it's the same as right when the condensation begins to occur. So 0 0.0149, um, the total pressure is 100 kilopascals. Um, then 0 0.622 plus 0 0.0149. And then PG is something we actually have to look up. So this is going to be in table A5. I'm sorry, table A4. Um, so we go in at 30 degrees Celsius. We find that this is 4.2469 kilopascal. And a little bit of math then tells us that the relative humidity is 0.551 or 55.1%. So we have now determined both the absolute as well as the relative humidity utilizing the dew point. Okay. Now again, this may be of some importance to us. Um, so this again was just another example problem that illustrates the usefulness of the dew point. However, as useful as this may be, it is somewhat cumbersome or tedious. If we were out in the field somewhere and we wanted to know what the conditions were of atmospheric air, do we really want to have to bring out a big heat exchanger and observe some sort of cooling process that could take hours to, to occur? Or maybe it won't. Maybe it'll just take minutes. But still, one would have to sit there for a long time and observe things very, very carefully and have all your temperature instrumentation and be very, very you know, accurate as to when the condensation begins to occur. Um, it's not like you can't do it, but it turns out that this is somewhat tedious, and there's another way to do it. So let's move on to the next topic, which is called adiabatic saturation. Now, please keep in mind what our goal is here. Our goal is to determine the amount of water vapor in the atmospheric air. Okay. Uh, sometimes we're interested in the absolute humidity omega. Sometimes we're interested in the relative humidity phi. But those are the terms that are generally of interest to us that give me some feel for the amount of comfort in that air. So what can we do to figure out the math? I'm sorry, figure out the water vapor um, component in the air. How do we find omega and phi? Well, turns out that there's this process called adiabatic saturation that we could utilize. Okay? Um, and we don't even need any kind of a heat transfer process, right? We don't need some sort of a cooler like we've just talked about over here. So what do we do? Well, if we take atmospheric air and run it through a big piece of insulated ductwork, and then um, as this air moves through the ductwork, actually allow it to flow over a pool of water, um, what's going to happen is that the air being at a different temperature than the water um, is, in fact, the air is typically warmer than the water. Um, the air would give some heat to the water. The water would actually evaporate out of the pool and evaporate into the airstream. So if we pass air across a pool of water, then we should be picking up more moisture. Um, and in doing so, we should be able to figure out the amount of water vapor in that atmospheric air. Now, how that's done at this point is certainly not really clear or obvious to us. Um, the mathematics is something I'll have to go through because unlike using the dew point, which is really just kind of a logical discussion, here I actually have to go through some mass and energy balance calculations and derive the equations that we're going to look for. The thing, though, is that once these equations are derived, we hopefully would understand that 
while the equations might be more complicated than just this, um, the methodology is a lot simpler. It's a lot more straightforward. So here's the adiabatic saturation process. So uh, let's say we have a, a large duct like so, and there's a pool of water. And this is liquid water in the bottom of this ductwork. Um, the atmospheric air is going to blow in, let's say, from this direction. And as the air moves through, um, some of the water vapor is going to evaporate into the, I'm sorry, some of the water from the pool will evaporate into the air. So water from pool evaporates into the air. Now, what do you suppose happens to the air as water evaporates into it? Um, keep in mind that there's a heat transfer process taking place. Okay? Um, it takes energy to vaporize water, any liquid, right? Um, it's the energy or enthalpy of vaporization, HFG, or perhaps UFG, depending on the process. Um, so when we go through this phase change, it takes energy, and that energy is going to actually come out of the air. So water from the pool is evaporated into the air. Energy is transferred from the air to the water. Um, and oh, I, I reversed that, didn't I? Energy is transferred from the water into the air. The air is having. Um, I'm sorry. Hold on a second. Is this right? I guess this is right, yeah. So we have the air. The air is transferred from the air to the water. That allows the water to vaporize. And as energy is transferred from the air, then the air also cools. So energy is transferred from the air to the water. And in doing so, the air cools. Um, eventually, it saturates. I mean, we can only evaporate so much water out of the pool into the air, right? This air has certain temperature associated with it, and the air is cooling. So as it cools, eventually it's going to cool down to some point, which will be considered saturation, right? It'll cool down to a point where we just can't evaporate any more water into it. So water from the pool evaporates into the air. Um, energy is transferred from the air to the water. The air cools. Um, the air finally reaches its minimum temperature, which corresponds to saturation. Okay. At this point, you can't cool the water anymore by evaporation. I'm sorry, you can't cool the air anymore by evaporation. So the air finally reaches the minimum temperature, corresponds to saturation. The temperature can no longer drop. Okay. And then keep in mind that during this whole process, everything is insulated, right? It's an adiabatic process. Um, therefore, the whole thing is insulated. So there's no heat loss into the surroundings. We only have heat transfer between the water and the air. And, and again, note that we call this saturation because of what's happening to the air, right? The air comes in, water vapor evaporates in, and we finally end up with saturated air coming out. So that's what we call it a saturation process. Okay. Now, it still may not be exactly clear how to solve a problem like this. Um, it shouldn't be clear at all. We haven't gone through the math yet. Is there a question? No, no, the air cools. That's a complete sentence. So. As heat is transferred from the air, the air cools down. So basically, the temperature is dropping, right? Temperature drops as the air is cooled. And then I would just simply note that the air, as it's cooling, finally reaches its minimum. I mean, you can only evaporate so much water into the air when that evaporation process is done. In other words, once the air is saturated, then no more heat transfer, no more water being evaporated. So does that make more sense? All right, so this is the basic process. Um, by the way, um, as you read about this in the book, it will talk a little bit about latent heat versus sensible heat. Um, this may be the first time you're actually exposed to that terminology. 
Um, when we talk about latent heat, we're talking about heat transfer associated with a phase change. Um, when we talk about sensible heat, we're actually talking about a temperature change itself. So for instance, if you look at the pool of water and the heat that it's exchanging, um, that would be um, basically latent heat, right? It's evaporation of that water into the air. Um, on the other hand, the temperature of the air is simply changing so it's dropping from, I don't know, let's say 30 down to 20 degrees, so that would be considered sensible heat. So the latent heat associated with the evaporation, in other words, the heat that's needed by the water for evaporation to occur, has to equal the sensible heat um, lost by the air during that evaporation process. Nonetheless, you'll read a little bit more about this. And now let's talk about the equations. So what we would do is we would note that the atmospheric air, I'm just going to call state point one. So here's state point one. I'll just put a circle around it so we can see it. Um, the air that finally leaves, the saturated air, is going to be state point two. Think of it as the final. Um, but also note that this pool of water is going to have some temperature associated with it as well. And we're going to call that just F. F for liquid. So the pool of water. We're just going to call it F. Okay, so these are the terms we're going to use here. Um, one thing I might also note, because this is important, um, this pool of water eventually has to have the same temperature as point two. I mean, think about it this way. If we're evaporating into the air and the air is cooling, um, if the air temperature ends up still warmer than the pool of water, then just sensible heat transfer will take place. No more evaporation will take place, but eventually the liquid water will have to get to the same temperature as the air. Okay? Um, and if for some reason that were reversed and the temperature of the air is, let's say, less than the pool of the water, well, then heat transfer is still going to take place, and, and eventually the pool of water will still get to the saturation temperature here at point two. Um, of course, that would imply that this process takes a long enough period of time and that there's enough surface area for the evaporation to take place and that this entire process is long enough, physically long enough. I mean, you have to have a long distance for the air to travel as heat transfer takes place. Um, you know, typically you want to have a nice but very shallow pool. That gives you lots of heat transfer and it allows for the heat transfer to take place pretty effectively. Uh, you'll learn all about this in your heat transfer class, how heat transfer is going to be a function of many things, including surface area. Nonetheless, let's just make that note that the temperature of point two and the temperature of the liquid that's evaporating out of the pool have to be the same. Okay. So what do the equations look like? And we'll start with mass balance equations. Um, even before I do that, does everybody at least generally understand what this process is? How by passing air across a water pool that the evaporation is going to take place and eventually it'll saturate that air. Um, some of you might have even tried this. I mean, I know when I go like say up into the mountains in the winter time where the air is incredibly cold, uh, as soon as I turn on the heater, I take big pans of water out and I put them right next to every um, register, you know, every heat register from the building's uh, heating system. And then as the air blows across that water, water evaporates into the air. Yeah, it cools the air down a little bit, but quite frankly, I'd rather give up a little temperature and get some moisture out of it so that the air is more comfortable. Um, some people will hang like wash rags or wet towels over the heating register so that as the air blows by, you get more evaporation into the air. So this is a process some of you perhaps have experienced. Maybe you haven't thought about it this way, but it's all about making the air more comfortable, right? So, the mathematics. Let's begin with mass balance equations. And um, we'll start with the dry air. OK, so for the dry air, we know that however much dry air flows through at point one, it's going to be exactly the same as a dry air that leaves at point two, right? I mean, mass has to be conserved. We're not accumulating mass within this adiabatic saturator. We're not diminishing the mass of the air. Whatever dry air flows in is going to flow out. So we'll just write that m dot a at one has to equal m dot of the dry air at two. 
And we might just call this m dot a for air. Okay. The dry air flows in and out at the same rate, so let's just call it m dot a. Now let's look at our mass balance for the water. And here we would note that we have three terms to deal with. Um, we have water that's coming in with the atmospheric air at point one. So we could just write this as m dot of the water vapor at one. Okay. But we also have some water that's evaporating out of the pool. Right? So we'll just call this m dot f. So that's the water that evaporates out of the pool. Um, and then the combined water that flows in as water vapor plus that which evaporates in, well, this has to equal the amount of water vapor that leaves at state point two, right? So we'll just call this m dot water vapor at two. Okay. So this is our basic mass balance equation. Um, one thing I will note is that omega uh, we know is defined as the ratio of the amount of water vapor to the amount of dry air. Um, we can divide by time in both the numerator and denominator. We can also just write this as the mass flow rate of the water vapor over the mass flow rate of the dry air. Okay. So this equation we can actually modify. We can say m dot v is therefore equal to omega times m dot a. And then this can actually be plugged in to the equation above. Okay. So we're just going to plug it into the equation above up here. And we will note that this is going to apply both at the inlet and at the exit. All right, so here we would note that this is going to be m dot a omega 1. Right? That's instead of m dot v1. Um, and then plus the mass flow rate of the water that evaporates out to the pool. And then this is going to have to equal omega times m dot a. Um, but this will be at the exit, so we'll just write this as m dot a times omega 2. Okay, please note that omega-1 and omega-2 are definitely not the same. Okay? Unlike the previous discussion and the previous example problem, um, in this adiabatic saturation process, we definitely have water vapor that's evaporating into the dry air, well, into the atmospheric air. It's definitely getting moister as it moves through. So uh, we definitely don't have the same specific humidity at the inlet and at the exit. Okay? So this is the equation. And lastly, we'll just rearrange. And we would note then that the rate that water is evaporating out of that pool is just going to be the difference between omega 2 and omega 1 times m dot air. And if nothing else, that equation should make good common sense to you. Um, after all, m dot a omega 1 represents the water vapor that comes in. m dot a omega 2 represents the water vapor that comes out. Where did that water vapor come from? Well, the difference between the two has to represent the water vapor that's evaporated out of that pool of water. It has to equal m dot f. So these equations, these mass balance equations, make sense logically. And now on to our energy balance equation. Now, when I use the word energy balance, it's the same thing as first law. So let's look at that. Um, often we call this an energy balance, but it's really just our first law analysis for a steady flow process. Now, like everything we've done, we're neglecting our kinetic and potential energy changes. Uh, there's no work associated with these processes. We just have flow. Um, so basically, whatever heat transfer takes place has to simply equal the change in the enthalpy. Really, it's the sum over all inlets of m dot times h at the inlet equals the sum over all exits of m dot times h at the exit, right? I mean, that's the basic first law. And we do have to use a summation because we do have two inlet streams, right, and then one exit stream. So our first law analysis then for the steady flow process would be as follows. All right, so again, we know there's no heat transfer because it's adiabatic. So no heat, no work, no nothing. We just end up with m dot h at the inlet has to equal m dot h sum over the exit. So we get the following. We have m dot a h1. That represents the inlet. Um, in fact, you know, I'll just write the first law 
Okay, so this is our first law for this particular type of process. Again, with no heat, no work, no kinetic and potential energy. So we have m dot a h1. That represents the atmospheric air that comes in. Um, we would also have our m dot f times the enthalpy of the liquid that comes in. Okay. Now, I might want to note at this point, as I did mention that the temperature at 2 and the temperature in the pool of water were actually going to be the same, um, what I could do is I could just put another subscript here. I could call this HF2. And again, this is just a reminder that we're talking about the same temperature at the exit. Okay, so this is a discharge temperature. Um, and in fact, HF kind of has two meanings here, doesn't it? Yes, we call that state point F, but F also refers to the saturated liquid. And we know that at any particular temperature, um, you know, the enthalpy will be that of the saturated liquid at that particular temperature. It doesn't even matter what the partial pressure is in the air. Um, the water is a compressed liquid in the atmosphere, and it's going to have about the same properties as the saturated liquid at that temperature. So we've seen that before. We'll just write this as HF2. Um, okay, and then lastly, on the right-hand side of the equation, we just have m dot a h2. Now, some of you may be looking at that saying, well, there might be some unit issues. If point one represents the atmospheric air, why am I not multiplying that enthalpy by the mass flow to the atmospheric air? Why am I multiplying by the mass flow to the dry air? And, and the same thing here at point two. Why, why am I multiplying that by the mass flow to the dry air? Well, remember the units, right? When we looked at H1 and H2 previously, that would be last week, well, that is the data for the mixture, but all of our data is per unit mass of the dry air. Right? So if this enthalpy is really in, let's say, kilojoules of the mixture per kilogram of the dry air, then we have to multiply by the dry air flow rate so that we end up with kilojoules per second in each one of our terms here. So there's nothing inconsistent with this and what we've already covered. Um, the units are indeed correct. So let's continue with this. We have m dot a h1 plus. Um, now you should be able to note that I can plug in this equation from the mass balance from before. So I'll put a little plug in below here. Um, so basically, m dot f is this term. So omega 2 minus omega 1, m dot a. And then we have the hf2 term. Um, and then on the right hand side, we still have m dot a h2. Okay. Now, let's rewrite this. Uh, remember again, h1 and h2 are for the atmospheric air. And as we saw last time, each of those enthalpies is just the sum of the enthalpy of the dry air component plus the humidity ratio, or again, specific or absolute humidity, times the enthalpy of the water vapor, right? So we'll rewrite. So we have m dot a, and then h1 is just going to be the enthalpy of the dry air plus omega at 1 times the enthalpy of the water vapor. So that is your enthalpy term at point 1. Um, by the way, this isn't quite right. This should say hg, not hv. Um, this is appropriate. This is the equation from last time. And I'll just put a little subscript 1 here so that we know that that whole term in the brackets corresponds to point 1. And then we have plus, um, and we have the same terms, omega 2 minus omega 1, m dot a, hf2. And then we have the m dot air. And again, instead of h2, we have ha plus omega hg at point 2. Um, by the way, I don't really have to put that 1 in there. Uh, subscript 1 applies to everything in the brackets. OK, so this is just a rearranging of that particular equation. And now what I want to do, as you can see, I can divide out the m dot a terms. So those all cancel. And let's rewrite one more time. So we have ha plus omega hg1, and then plus omega 2 minus omega 1, hf2 equals ha plus omega hg at 2.
And then let's rearrange one more time. Um, let me put the HA terms together. So this will be HA1 minus HA2. So those terms have been combined together. Um, let's also combine together those terms that have an omega-1 in them. So we have omega-1, and then here's an HG1 and an HF2. So omega-1 times HG1 minus HF2. And then on the right-hand side, let's just put together all the terms that have an omega-2 in them. So this is going to be omega-2. And then we have an HF2 and an HG2. So just HD2 minus HF2. Now, the next thing I want to do is just remind everybody that we're treating these gases as if they're ideal gases with constant specific heats. Um, the value of HA is just going to be Cp times the temperature difference. So this is going to be Cp for the dry air, and then times T1 minus T2. So that's what we're going to plug in for that particular term. And then also let's keep in mind that the difference between HG and HF is just what we call HFG. This applies at point 2. So this is really the same as HFG at 2. So I can now rewrite, and I get Cp of the dry air times T1 minus T2 plus omega 1, and then HG1 minus HF2. And then that equals omega 2 times HFG at 2. And last but not least, I'm going to just solve this for omega 1. So we get omega 1 is going to equal the following. Um, so the Cp T2 minus T1 is going to actually go on the other side of the equation. And I don't want to put a minus sign in the equation, so I'm just going to reverse the order of T1 and T2. So we have Cp for the dry air times T2 minus T1. And then we have plus the omega 2 HFG at 2. And then lastly, we just divide by Hg at 1 minus Hf at 2. So this is the equation that we get for our adiabatic saturation process. <clears throat> now, just like I had said at the very beginning, this equation is certainly a little more cumbersome than the equations that we use just by utilizing our understanding of the dew point. However, the mathematics here might be a little more complicated, but the process is actually a little bit easier. You don't need any kind of heat exchangers anymore. All you need is just a, a big insulated duct and a little bit of water. And if you measure the temperature going in and the temperature going out, you end up having everything you need to calculate omega at point one, which is our atmospheric air. Um, I mean, CP is just for air, we're assuming ideal gas constant specific heat at room temperature. T2 is known, T1 is two known. Uh, what about omega-2? Well, remember, omega-2 corresponds to the saturated air at the exit, and that's only going to be a function of the partial pressure of the water vapor at that particular exit temperature. So we'll have measured that. Um, so we should be able pretty easily to find Pg at that particular temperature. And therefore, using the equation, just like the one we used in the previous example, we could use that equation to find omega-2. So that's known just based on the temperature at the exit. So yeah, everything is known. So basically, knowing T1 and T2, which we've measured, um, and typically, we're going to also need to know the atmospheric conditions. Um, but nonetheless, Knowing this data, we can easily find omega-1, which is for the atmospheric air. Okay. So I don't expect everybody to know exactly what to do at this point, but it sure looks like it's pretty straightforward. Um, So let's do an example problem. Okay. So this example is actually out of the seventh edition of your textbook. Uh, 
I'm just going to write it down because frankly it's going to take less time to write it down than to figure out that computer and the overhead system and all that again. So here's the example. Um, and this is actually 1434 from edition 7 of your textbook. Basically it says that atmospheric air um, Okay, yeah, atmospheric air. Oh, you know what? Uh, I have to apologize again. I'm a little bit ahead on this example problem. There's actually one other thing I wanted to mention real briefly, and then we'll talk about this example problem. So it, that is the right example, but I'm just not quite ready to do it yet. I mean, I could do it now, but it, there's one other thing I wanted to mention. All right, so we look at the adiabatic saturation process. We understand that the process is pretty straightforward, but still it's just a little bit cumbersome. I mean, at the end of the day, we still have to have some sort of a device that has enough room in it, there's a pool of water, it's well insulated. I mean, that's still going to be a little bit of a problem. So what, what else could we do? Is there something else that we could do possibly? Well, it turns out there is. There, there's a special device that's called the psychrometer, and the psychrometer is this. This is a psychrometer. It's actually called a sling psychrometer. And what you can't really see, but maybe you can if I point it, um, there's actually two thermometers on here. Okay? One thermometer is dry. It's just open to the environment. The other thermometer has a wick on it. Okay? Um, and then there's a little pool here for you to put water in. And then what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to blow across this thing. Now, you can get electric psychrometers with a little electric motor and a little fan that's going to blow across. But this is kind of an old-fashioned device. You just swing it for about two minutes or so. And in doing so, isn't this essentially the same thing as adiabatic saturation? Aren't I just taking air in, in doing this and allowing the air to blow across this wetted wick? And isn't this wetted wick really no different than that little pool that sits on the bottom of that adiabatic saturator? Um, it is. There's a little pool of water in here. And as we blow across it, the water is going to evaporate off of this wick in exactly the same way that water would be evaporating out of the pool. And eventually, the temperature on this wick, as its temperature associated with water evaporating, will be the same as the temperature of the saturated air that leaves, which will be the same as the temperature of the water within that pool. So it turns out you don't need an entire adiabatic saturation process. All you need is one little psychrometer. And these two temperatures are called the dry bulb temperature. The dry bulb, because there's nothing on the wick. Um, so that's the actual temperature. That would be the temperature of the environment. And the other temperature on the wetted wick, we would call the wet bulb temperature. Um, it's called the wet bulb because the wick is wet. It's always wet. Um, and as such, we would call it the wet bulb temperature. And in fact, this wet bulb temperature is the same as the temperature of the saturated air that's leaving the adiabatic saturator. So by introducing us to the psychrometer, it turns out we don't really need the entire adiabatic saturation device. Okay, so I'll just note here that we observe that flow over the two thermometers one dry, one wet on a psychrometer actually emulates the flow through an adiabatic saturator. or call an adiabatic saturation device if you want, OK? Um, T1, which is the atmospheric air temperature, is what we would call T dry bulb, or just simply T dB. And T2, which is the saturated air temp, um, we would call this wet bulb, so just T wet bulb. And for that, we just use T with the subscript WB. So basically, we can use the same equation 
So using the same equation as we did for an adiabatic saturation process, we'll just simply rewrite it to consider the wet and the dry bulb temperature rather than just calling it T1 and T2. So using the same equation as above, we use T dry bulb in place of T1. We use T wet bulb in place of T2. So what does our equation become then? All right, so omega, and this would be the omega of the atmospheric air. So I'll just keep that as just omega 1. Um, this is now going to be Cp for the air. And then instead of T2 minus T1, well, this is going to be the wet bulb temperature minus the dry bulb temperature. And by the way, uh, don't confuse dry bulb with dew point. You know, dew point is dp as a subscript, and this is db. So yeah, they're kind of similar, but they're definitely totally different. Totally different concepts, right? So anyway, so we've replaced that. Um, and then we add to this um, omega. Now, I could call it omega 2, but why don't I just write it omega at the wet bulb temperature, just to make sure this is real clear. And then HFG is also at state point 2, which again is at the temperature of the wet bulb. So there's wet bulb temperature. And then there's denominator. This is just going to be HG at the dry bulb temperature and then minus HF, again, at the wet bulb temperature. Okay. So this is going to give you the specific humidity for the atmospheric air. Right. So again, we don't actually need to go through an adiabatic saturation process. Um, by the way, I've been mentioning for years and years that it would be kind of cool if a student wanted to do a senior project um, to build an adiabatic saturator and then compare it to a psychrometer. Um, there's lots of psychrometers around. You can buy these. They're pretty cheap. But um, students, for some reason, don't want to build an adiabatic saturator. So it's still a possibility, you know, something some of you might want to think about for the future. Um, by the way, I'm just going to kind of let this come around the classroom. And please don't hit anybody with it. But you're welcome to look at it. All right, so now I'm ready to do the example problem. And this is example 14-34 from, well, I almost started to write it before. OK, so again, any questions in general? All right, so we have this equation. And it would appear that as long as we know the wet and the dry bulb temperatures, or if we want to think about it, as long as we know the ambient temperature and the temperature leaving the adiabatic saturation device, we should be able to find what we want to give us a measure of the comfort level of the air, right? We can find omega. We can find phi. So let's try again. 1434 from the seventh edition of your textbook. Basically, it says that air in a room has a dry bulb temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit and a wet bulb temperature of 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the atmospheric pressure is just the standard 14.7 PSIA. And we want to find the specific humidity, the relative humidity, and we also want to find the dew point temperature for this particular process. OK. So it sounds like a pretty straightforward problem. And indeed, it is. Um, Really, most of the problem is just finding the data that we need. Um, much of the data, almost all the data, really, is just going to come right out of our tables. So let's look at that equation. We can look up Cp, no problem, T1 and T2. Well, that's the wet and the dry bulb that's given. Um, HFG at 2, we can look that up in the tables, HG1, HF2. I mean, all that can be looked up in the tables. The only thing that we can't really look up is omega. So let's note that omega 2, again, is not the same as omega 1, right? Um, omega 2 represents the specific humidity as we leave the adiabatic saturator, or if you will, the specific humidity associated with the wet bulb temperature. Um, let's also note, just before we do this problem, that the wet bulb temperature can never be higher than the dry bulb temperature, right? Um, it's an evaporation process. Uh, when we evaporate into an airstream, um, 
that's going to take energy out of the water and the water is going to cool. So we definitely are going to have a wet bulb temperature lower than the dry bulb temperature without exception. They, they could be equal, but only if the air is already completely saturated. Um, so we need to find omega-2 and let's do so. So, well, we know that the air is saturated. So we would just use the equation. Um, again, I think I called it equation C. So this is the equation we would use in this particular situation. Um, now I put P2 here, but I mean it's just the same as P1. It's just the atmospheric pressure. Maybe I don't even want to write P2 here. We'll just note this is P. This is the total pressure. This is the atmospheric pressure. Um, what about PG? Well, this is the saturation pressure that corresponds to the wet bulb temperature, right? So here we're going to have to go into table A4. Um, and we're going to look up data at 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And the saturation pressure is PG2. And we just find that this is 0.30578. PSIA. Okay. So we have this particular data. Um, well, that's great. We can find this now. 0.622 times 0.30578 divided by 14.7 minus 0.30578. And both of these are in the same pressure units, so they're going to cancel. And remember, 0.622 is just the ratio of the gas constants, which gives you the units of pounds mass water vapor per pound mass of dry air. So we end up with omega-2 then of 0 0.01321 pounds mass water vapor per pound mass of dry air. Okay, so this is omega-2. Um, now again, you could show this as omega at the temperature of the wet bulb. That's the same thing as 0.2, right? Um, we can show this as PG at the wet bulb temperature instead of PG2. Um, I'm, I'm kind of looking at two different equations, which mean exactly the same thing. All right, so now we have a omega here. Um, now we should be able to find omega at 0.1, which is our atmospheric air. So again, we'll just look at these equations here. Um, for air at room temperature, we just go into table A2, part A we find that Cp is equal to 0.24. This is in BTUs per pound mass. Um, and this is specifically for the air, the dry air component. So I should probably little, put a little subscript A. So we have 0.24 BTUs per pound mass. And then that would be per degree Fahrenheit. And then we multiply it by the temperature difference, T2 minus T1. So that's just 65 minus 80. It's also in Fahrenheit. So there's my first term. Um, omega-2 I have from above, 0.01321 pounds water vapor per pound of dry air. And then HFG2, well, this is something I'm going to have to look up again at in table A4. I suppose when I was in A4 earlier, um, I probably should have looked up this data as well. So let's also look up then HFG at that 65 degrees. So HFG2 can also be looked up. Um, and we get that that number is 1056.5. That's BTUs per pound mass of water vapor, right? So 1056.5 BTUs per pound mass of the water vapor. So there's your numerator terms. And then in the denominator, well, again, we're going to have to look up some data. Um, Hg at 80 degrees, right? So Hg at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if we look that up, again, we go into table A4. And at 80 degrees, we get 1,096.1. Um, that's going to be BTUs per pound mass of water vapor. Okay. And then we subtract from it HF at 2. Uh, now again, uh, if I were thinking ahead, then up here when I went into table A4, I would have also looked up the value of HF, and we find that this is 
And again, this is BTUs per pound mass. Um, and it is for water. I, I don't really want to put a V because they're not really water vapor at this point, but it is water. Anyway, so 33.08 BTUs per pound mass of water. So now it's just a matter of going through the math. Um, you should notice that the BT units are gonna, BTU units are going to cancel. Um, the pounds mass of water from the denominator of the denominator will move into the numerator. So we have pounds mass of water vapor. And then pounds mass of dry air goes into the denominator. The temperature units cancel. So the units work out correctly. We end up with a certain amount of water vapor per certain amount of dry air. And again, if we go through mathematically, we end up with 0 0.00974 pounds mass water vapor per pound mass of air. So the process itself was really quite simple. Um, the mathematics isn't too bad, um, but the process is simple. We just take our psychrometer and swing it around for a couple of minutes, record the wet and dry bulb temperatures, look up a bunch of data, and find the humidity. Now this is only the first part of the problem. The next part of the problem requires that we find the relative humidity. So you know you'll have to go back to equation C. Um, in this particular equation, well this is just omega times the pressure over 0.622 plus omega times the saturation pressure. Um, since we're looking up this data for the atmospheric air, which is 0.1, then it wouldn't hurt to put omega-1 and P1, PG-1, et cetera, et cetera, just to remind us to use the right terms. I mean, after all, we have a couple of different PGs now, right? We have a saturation pressure at the wet bulb temperature, PG-2. We certainly don't want to use that. Um, we also have omega of 0.2, right? And we don't want to use that either. So again, make sure you put the right subscripts so that you're using the right data in these equations. Again, it's just a matter of plugging in numbers. So 0 0.00974 pounds water vapor per pound of dry air. Um, P1, again, is just the total pressure. The same as P2, if you will. It's just 14.7 PSIA. And then 0 0.622 plus 0 0.00974. Okay. And that's going to be... Um, oh, then we multiply PG1 onto it. So that's another bit of data that we're going to have to pull out of our tables. So PG1, um, again, we go into table A4 at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and PSAT is PG1, and this is 0 0.50745. PSIA, so 0.5. 0.0745 PSIA. Okay. Oh, by the way, I forgot my units here. Um, the 0.62 plus omega 1 is going to have the same units as omega. It's just going to be pounds mass water vapor per pound mass of air. Well, anyway, PSIA units cancel, mass units all cancel. We're left with the relative humidity, which is a dimensionless number. And we end up with 0.447, or if you prefer, 44.7%. Okay. So that's the relative humidity for this particular problem. Now, the last thing you're asked to do is find the dew point. Um, we haven't talked about dew point in the context of this type of adiabatic saturation process, but we know what the dew point is, right? We know it's just a saturation um, temperature at the partial pressure of the water vapor. So we need to figure out which partial pressure of the water vapor we need. And since we're talking about data for the atmospheric air, right, we want to find the, the dew point uh, not for the saturated air, associated with what is leaving the adiabatic saturator, or if you will, the wet bulb temperature. Um, we're talking about the atmospheric air, right? So we need to first find the appropriate saturation, temperature, well, pressure first, and then at that partial pressure of the water vapor, we could find the saturation temperature, and that gives us our dew point. So 
what we need is PV of the atmospheric air. Um, and we know that this is going to be phi times PG for that atmospheric air. I mean, this is really just from our definition of the relative humidity. So PG1 is just the saturation pressure at the dry bulb temperature of 80 degrees. So again, we go into our tables. Um, back into table A4, we have 0.447 as a relative humidity. Um, the saturation pressure corresponding to 80. Um, actually, we've already looked that up, right? It's this, 0.50745. down there. Okay, um, and this is in PSIA. So the partial pressure of the water vapor in the atmospheric air is 0.2268 PSIA. And then we're going to have to go into our tables and we'll note that the dew point is simply the saturation temperature at the partial pressure of the water vapor. So that's Tsat at 0.2268 PSIA. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, that's really easy to look up, right? Um, I know the pressure. It's just a matter of going into table A5 and at that pressure looking up the saturation temperature. But unfortunately, it's not that easy. Um, if you look into the British units of these particular tables, or English units if you prefer, what you may notice is that the lowest pressure entry is 1 PSIA. So you kind of have two choices. You can go into table A5 and actually extrapolate the data below the bottom entry in that particular table, which is certainly doable. But it's probably easier just to recognize that if you go to table A4, table A4, which is a temperature table, actually goes down to much lower temperatures and pressures. So you don't want to use table A5 because it's below the lowest entry in that particular table, um, you actually need to use A4 and interpolate on this particular table because you do have the data you need for that interpolation. Nonetheless, once you go through the interpolation, you'll find that this temperature is 56.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So on this particular day, um, you know, while the air is comfortable, we're certainly well above the dew point. Um, only if we were to cool the temperature down even further, um, you know, cool below 56 and a half degrees, only then will the water start to condense out of the air. So there's an example problem that deals with this material. Now, as we go through all this, um, I'm sure you're thinking, wow, this is a whole lot of data that we're going to need. It's a little bit confusing because now we have a wet and a dry bulb temperature. Um, a lot of our numbers are going to have to be pulled out of different tables. Is there an easier way to deal with air water vapor mixtures? And the fact is, th th there is. Um, there's a chart that is in your textbook. It's described in the next section of your textbook. Uh, I guess it's 14.5, yeah, I suppose. Um, this particular chart is called a psychrometric chart. Um, it turns out that if we know any two properties, like for instance, if we know the wet and the dry bulb temperature, we can get anything else we want. And that's just been demonstrated on this example problem. So what's been done is data has been correlated on one particular figure, and it's not just data for omega or phi. Um, there's also enthalpy data on there. There's specific volume data on there. Um, all this is going to be presented in your psychrometric chart. And unfortunately, we don't have any more time today. So the very first thing we'll do next time is start looking at psychrometric charts. And that'll be the easy way to find our data. Um, nonetheless, um, the homework that's due on Wednesday from last week, please do not use a psychrometric chart, right? We haven't introduced you to that until this coming Wednesday. You can read ahead in the book, but the intention is not to have you solve those using a psych chart. Yeah, you're supposed to solve those using the basic equations that we've been dealing with. Anyway, that's all for today. So please don't forget to pick up your homework if you haven't from last week. And I will see you all Wednesday. We'll talk more about your midterm exam Wednesday as well. So see you all then. Thank you.